Now at one, thou shalt not kill re-examines the case of the body in Hume Street. This program contains strong language which some viewers may find offensive. Hume Street in the heart of Dublin, not a stone's throw away from Stephen's Green. Today these elegant Georgian buildings are occupied by businesses whose smart offices indicate a thriving and successful commercial centre. But in the Dublin of the 1950s, they were not quite so upmarket. Most of them were let out in flats and small apartments. It was the morning of the 15th of April, 1956. Patrick Rigney's milk round took him and his lad, Anthony Kiernan, round St. Stephen's Green past Hume Street. Man and boy saw a woman standing over a crumpled bundle on the footpath. It was 20 past six. A few minutes later, Rigney drove into Hume Street. Although the woman was gone, what looked like a bundle of rags was still there. Rigney ran for the police. Unknown to himself, he'd found more than a body, though that was serious enough. He'd stumbled upon something which the respectable Ireland of the time would sooner not have known about. Within a short time, the Gardaí were on the scene. It was clear to them that the body of the young woman in Hume Street had not died of natural causes. The investigation team was led by Detective Superintendent George Lawler, a man noted for his thoroughness. A veteran of the War of Independence, he joined the new police force and risen quickly through its ranks. No, we haven't touched any waiting for forensics to come. He was also an enthusiast for the scientific approach to crime then being rapidly developed. Has the milkman made a statement? He's down at the station, they're looking after that down there. From the contents of her bag, Lawler and his team quickly established the identity of the young woman. Her bank book told them that she was Helen O'Reilly. Gardy established that Helen O'Reilly had been born and grown up in Kilkenny. She'd been married to an adventurer who had arrived here in Ireland as a German spy during the war. The marriage had broken up. She had six children, all now in care. She'd gone to live in Preston in the north of England, and then she'd come back to Ireland. They sorted out the sad contents of her bag. Hmm. 
but it was one of her shoes and some fibres found on it that was ultimately to have vital importance. And this intrigued Superintendent Lawler. Well, my father, um, I suppose professionally, he, he really learned himself from day one. Like he went into the police force in 1924, 25, when it was set up, and um, he spent, he got the um, title of a sergeant, and he was sent to Galway. And it must have been his proneness to detect the work that they sent him back to Dublin. And they set up a technical bureau in John's Road in, in Kingsbridge. He set himself then a task of improving the, the detection of crime. And one of his first things he did was he joined a correspondence course with the FBI for fingerprinting. So as a profession, I suppose he thought himself he was teaching himself right through his, through his lifetime to his death. Memories were jogged by newspaper coverage and the description of the victim, and Gardy were able to establish the movements of Helen O'Reilly on the days before her death. The post-war Ireland of the 1950s was, for most, a grey and conservative place. Unemployment and emigration were high, and those who remained made do with very limited money. For one person in April 1956, the social life of the bars and small hotels seemed to hold a magnetic attraction. She was in and out of them every night. Helen O'Reilly was the life and soul of the informal party she joined and a variety of different establishments. She was vivacious, attractive, and appeared to have the gift of easy popularity which drew others to her. But was there not also something desperate about her gaiety? My mother was a outgoing, friendly person who was, to most people on the surface, quite happy, but I would say, from being her eldest child, I got a feeling that she wasn't very happy. She was stuck out in a house on her own most of the time, because my father was away working, with six children outside Bray on the N.S. Gary Road, and I think it was quite a lonely life for her, really. And she didn't... She didn't display that to people in general. But I often got this... You know, I'd often hear... Um, from her, you know, or get the feeling from her that... She was... She found us all... She found it very hard to cope in that situation. Helen O'Reilly was one of life's casualties. Her marriage to John O'Reilly had ended and her children were taken into care. And since then, she drifted between relationships and between Ireland and Britain. I remember reading her reading out a letter one day from my father saying that she had permission to put us into a convalescent home for the time being. And she did put us into Linden convalescent home. And eventually speaking, we ended up in St. Teresa's which was run by the Sisters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul. That was for boys in Black Rock. And my sisters ended up in St. Clair's Orphanage in Harold's Cross. I just think that my mother couldn't cope, basically. And maybe she was hoping for some breathing space while she got a few things together. I don't know. Maybe my father might come back to live in Ireland or whatever. They'd set up a home together and we'd come, we'd be bought out again. But certainly never really thought for any minute that this was going to be for the, for the rest of her childhood, being in those places.
But what had brought Helen O'Reilly to Hume Street? Detective Superintendent Lawler's team established that she'd arrived here on the 4th of April, almost a fortnight before her death. During that time, she'd stayed in different boarding houses around the city. In the evenings, she'd frequented bars and pubs. She'd linked up with and spent them with different men. She appeared happy. Perhaps she was, as is often the case, glad to be back in her own country. In spite of the many bad memories it may have held for her. Yeah, I seen her. I seen her last week there. She's talking to the gentleman. Who was she with? You can you recall? She was with a nice gentleman there, having great fun there together. Right. Absolutely no. Didn't seem any problems around here. No, that. absolutely not. No was problem. he a local man? Well, I've never seen him here before. No. Mm -hmm. you know, he was just yeah. sitting there, there, having seemed to be getting on great, like you know, we're all having a bit of skid. All right. And how long was she here for? Do you think? Oh, I'd say over an hour and a half, anyway. At least. Say, yeah. mm -hmm. Didn't seem to be anything. No problems. Nothing on. But as the detectives were to find out. There was another reason for Helen O'Reilly's enforced gaiety. Here in this grim and sterile resting place, a post-mortem examination took place. And it didn't take the state pathologist, Dr. Morris Hickey, long to discover that the woman was five months pregnant. The cause of death was simple and straightforward enough. During what's called an illegal operation, a pocket of air had got into the bloodstream and stopped the circulation. Unconsciousness would have occurred within 15 seconds and death very shortly after that. Helen O'Reilly had died having an illegal abortion. But just what exactly are the risks with these backstreet abortions? Some of the risks with backstreet abortions uh, would be hemorrhage. Uh, this would depend to some extent on the level uh, of skill of the operator and their, um, the availability to them of, of um, appropriate uh, drugs. Um, infection, which, which would be um, a late um, it, w it wouldn't emerge uh, in the immediate uh, uh, time of the abortion. It would, it would present at a later stage. Uh, an, a sort of remote risk uh, would be perforation of the uterus leading to sudden um, collapse. Uh, that can happen to a sort of vagal reflex um, collapse if the, if, if the peritoneal cavity is opened. Um, and if the particular technique involved uh, includes the Higginson syringe, then uh, air embolus or fluid embolus uh, would certainly be um, a feature. Would certainly feature in the in the risks. The police now knew the cause of death and were well aware of the underground network of abortionists in Dublin. Their grim trade had been at its height during the war years when travel to Britain was restricted women who were pregnant and who desired an abortion could not easily travel. As a result, the trade here flourished. Of course, not every unwanted pregnancy resulted in an illegal abortion. Many women finding themselves in this situation would leave their homes for the anonymity of the city and having given birth to a baby would have it adopted. There were legitimate agencies, often operated by the clergy, that would help women in this situation. In 1939, in a case which attracted a certain notoriety, a baby, six weeks old, had been abandoned by the roadside in Dunshockham, County Meath. The police questioned one Mary Ann Cadden, Nurse Cadden, who'd come to their notice before in matters of women and babies. She was convicted of abandoning the infant, thereby putting its health at risk. Evidence was given that the person who left it there did so in daylight, and the driver of the open sports car was clearly identified by a witness as the person the police knew as Mary Ann Cadden, by a schoolboy taking car numbers. Cadden, whose profession was given as midwife, was convicted of abandoning the infant. She was sentenced to 12 months in Mountjoy 
and subsequently struck off the midwife's register. Mary Ann Cadden, or Mamie as she was known, was an abortionist and she made a good living out of it. She continued her illegal practice all through the war years. She advertised in the newspapers offering a, a wide variety of reliefs and medicines. But for those in trouble and who knew the code of Dublin then, she was in fact offering abortions. In 1945, a young housemaid almost bled to death after an attempted abortion. The housemaid gave evidence and Nurse Catton, as she continued to call herself, was convicted of unlawfully procuring a miscarriage. This time, the Gardaí were able to prosecute her for what they'd always suspected she was up to. Mamie, Mary Ann Cadden, went off to serve another sentence in Mountjoy, this time for five years. Yes, I am. Well, look, if you can't reach Brian, how are you going to get there? It's all right, I'll ring for taxi. Taxi be damned, right, the car does You'd have thought that this might have prevented her from practicing her grim trade, but no, not a bit of it. In June of 1951, a young woman bled to death here on this street. She was a showgirl who'd danced at the Olympia and Gaiety theatres, and forensic examination showed that she died while having an abortion. And she died not far from number 17 Hume Street, where Mamie Cadden had set up her latest medical practice. And although she was questioned by the Gardaí on that occasion, no charge was ever prepared against her. So the file on Mamie Cadden was now being looked at with great interest. And this time, in the case of Helen O'Reilly, there was much more to go on. Fibres from Helen O'Reilly's coat were examined. Some were identified as coming from rabbit fur. A crushed cigarette butt on the heel of her shoe had fibres from some kind of floor matting. It was a question of matching those. Clearly, the place to examine was where Nurse Cadden still practised. Ten days after Helen O'Reilly was found dead in Hume Street, Gardy returned, this time backed by a search warrant. They now had enough information to justify a full questioning of her and a thorough search of her premises. It's open. I knew it wouldn't be long before you lot showed up. I warrant to search the premises. Ah, fuck your warrant. She didn't make it easy for them. Nurse Cadden, American-born, had a foul tongue and an assertive manner. But if she hoped to intimidate the detectives, she failed. And the search revealed some very relevant items indeed. What the Gardaí itemised and took away from the back room on the first floor of Hume Street would form the bulk of the case against Nurse Cadden. Here, they were convinced, was a makeshift surgery used to terminate pregnancies. Asked about the contents of the hat box, she said they contained specula for an internal examination, but that they hadn't been used for years. Even that claim was easily contradicted by the clear and recent marks of fingers on the box. They took away samples of hair fibres from her fur stoles, from the matting in her room, and one item which was to prove a damning storehouse of information that linked Nurse Catton to the dead woman, her diary. In it were listed Nurse Cadden's customers. Many were for routine ailments like rheumatism and what appeared to be the scourge of the country then, constipation, for which an enema was required. Treatments costing a few shillings a time. But why were some patients identified only by the colour of their coats? Forensic reconstruction of the diary showed the original entry to read Black Coat. It was clear from Cadden's diary that some of her clients, those for whom she performed a particular service, were known only by the description of what they were wearing. Helen O'Reilly was wearing a black coat when her body was found.
That in itself would not be enough to charge, let alone convict. But taken together with other forensic evidence, the case against Nurse Cadden was mounting. For instance, the rabbit hairs from the dead woman's black coat match the rabbit hairs from one of Nurse Cadden's fur wraps. There was the connection between the fibres found on the cigarette butt on her shoe. Those matched the fibres taken from the mat in Cadden's room at 17 Hume Street. Putting the whole lot together, Lawler now felt he'd got sufficient evidence to charge Nurse Cadden with the unlawful killing of Helen O'Reilly. The law is that if you kill someone during the course of a felony, even though you didn't intend to, then you can be charged with murder. And the procurement of an illegal miscarriage, an abortion, is a felony. In other words, a serious crime. So if your patient dies during such an abortion, then the charge will be murder. And so it was in the case of the people versus Mary Ann Cadden. Nurse Cadden protested her innocence. She'd never met the dead woman, she said. She'd been in her room all night on the 17th of April, 1956. She neither heard nor saw anything of Helen O'Reilly. The charge was a concoction of lies fabricated by the police who were out to get her, and they'd regret this. Further, she was a citizen of the United States and could not be charged here. The President of America would see to that. But Superintendent Lawler had been waiting a long time to get Nurse Cadden. Well, between Nurse Cadden and my father, it was a strange thing. Cadden got into my father's mind, he got into her mind. It was a breaking of minds. And uh, I, I can always remember him coming home and spending hours in, in his bedroom rewriting and writing the questions, going back to her. And um, but I remember him speaking to my mother about it and saying, uh, this is certainly a breaking of minds, and I'm going to break Catton. Arrested and charged in May, it was the month of October 1956, before Nurse Cadden was brought here to the Central Criminal Court in Green Street for trial. And in the intervening months, both the state and the Gardaí had had plenty of time to prepare their case. It was circumstantial, of course, because Nurse Catton had made no admission whatsoever. And their case, based on circumstantial evidence, was this. In the absence of any admission, the prosecution set out to show that Helen O'Reilly, finding herself pregnant and desiring to terminate her pregnancy, had made an appointment to visit Nurse Cadden at number 17 Hume Street. yourself. Come in. Oh, I'm strong there. Uh, you can hang your coat up there in the hook. Now, money.
Mm. Get that into you. Thank you. prosecution case was that Nurse Cadden had attempted to abort Helen O'Reilly of the infant she was carrying. Sometime between the late evening of April the 17th and the early hours of the following day, the operation which Nurse Cadden attempted went horribly wrong. The particular technique she used, which involves inserting a small hollow probe-like object into the cervix and pumping under pressure of a hand bulb, a fluid into the uterine cavity with the purposes of stripping off the membranes surrounding the fetus, thereby precipitating a miscarriage or abortion. The risk uh, involves in this stripping procedure, uh, certain venous sinuses on the uh, inside of the uterus uh, are opened and there's a serious risk of pumping the fluid a small amount of which wouldn't do you any great harm. If the system hasn't been fully purged of air, there's a serious risk of pumping air into the venous circulation. This can, and in this case obviously did, leads to um, a catastrophic um, collapse of the patient and uh, ultimately their demise. In Helen O'Reilly's case, that's exactly what happened. She'd have felt faint and lost consciousness within 30 seconds of the air getting into the bloodstream. Death followed not long after, within minutes. Faced now with a dead body on her hands, what to do? As the prosecution saw it, Nurse Cadden had dragged the dead woman down the stairs of number 17 Hume Street. There was ample evidence from another resident of the house who had heard a heavy dragging sound in the early hours, quote, like furniture being moved, unquote, she said. Another witness who lived nearby and who'd left for work around that time had noticed nothing unusual. Nurse Cadden had waited, the prosecution said, until the street was clear, then continued with her grim removal. She had dragged the body along the street, legs tied to try and limit the flow of blood. But then, at about 6.25 a.m., the milkman, Patrick Rigney, had unexpectedly, from her point of view, come around the corner with his deliveries. And what he saw was to be another crucial piece of evidence against Nurse Cadden.
he described in detail what the woman he saw in the basement looked like. And although he was subjected to intense cross-examination on the grounds that he had seen her for only a few seconds, milkman Patrick Rigney was not to be shaken in his description. Clearly in the court, the jury had little doubt that the woman in the dock before them was the woman Rigney had seen in the basement of number 15 Hume Street. It was one of those cases where the weight of circumstantial evidence was as strong, if not stronger, than any admission of guilt which might be later retracted. And so it was that Mamie Cadden was found guilty of the murder of Helen O'Reilly. She was unrepentant as the judge sentenced her to be hanged, saying this was not her country. You'll never do it, she said. She would appeal to the President of the United States. And in a final comment, she said, I'm not a Catholic, so take that now. As the 